I'm going to start the uh, attendance thing right now. So please get on your device. And I, I, I'll be able to give you a, a code here in a minute. I don't know why it takes a while, but apparently it does. Okay, folks, um, if you want to sign into the class today, the, the code is 9958. Okay, 9958. Um, so while you're doing that, for those just coming in, the code to sign in is 9958. Um, so, um, We've, we've, as you know, we're through uh, three quizzes thus far. We're going to have one more quiz. I think it goes live uh, next Monday. I think I'll, you can check the, you can check the um, syllabus. Um, and then, as I mentioned last time, the, the we'll, we're going to have a final project, which is going to be a PowerPoint presentation that you guys are going to make and submit. Um, and that assignment, I think, goes live, uh, like in a two or three weeks. It's like November 10th, I think. Um, okay, any questions before we get started? Very good. All right. Well, um, as promised, we're in the midst of a really good run of outstanding guests. And today we have as our guest uh, my good friend Eric Howler. Eric is an architect who was born in Cali, Colombia. He's an educator and co-founder of the architecture firm Howler um, a multidisciplinary architecture and design studio founded, founded in 2005. He's an assistant professor at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Prior to forming Howler and Yoon, uh, he worked for Diller and Scafidio, a, a very well-known firm in New York City, uh, as well as Cone Pedersen Fox Associates. I'm, I'm going to ask him questions about both of those things later. He's the co-author of Expanded Practice, uh, Howler Yoon Architecture at my studio, um, published by Princeton Architectural Press in 2009. And he's the author of Skyscraper, Vertical Now, published by Rizzoli Universe Publishers in 2003. He received a Bachelor of Architecture and a Master's of Architecture from Cornell University. He is a lead AP and a registered architect in the state of New York, the states of New York, Massachusetts, Virginia, New Jersey, Rhode Island, and the District of Columbia. Excuse me, um, could you s sit down up there in the blue jacket? Thanks. Um, in uh, 2015, he collaborated with Todd Macover of the MIT Media Lab to propose an empathy pavilion for the Dubai 2020 Expo, another thing about which I will surely have a question or two. Please join me in welcoming Eric Howler. So you, you can, I can stand over you can here. You just do it from there. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll watch it on the monitor. Where are you going to be? I'll, I'll just be here. Thank you. Okay. Hi guys. Um, thanks for coming. Um, 
George asked me to show you uh, some design work and also talk about design process. I understand you guys have done a lot of thinking about um, how to design, how to understand um, your users, how to uh, sort of outlay a uh, design process and how to sort of assess how uh, successful your designs are. So uh, I'm going to show you some work that we've done in our firm. Um, I, I called the, the talk um, Public Interface, and I like to think about our work uh, always sort of falling at an interface between uh, a, a range of public and private situations. And you could say that in some sense, architecture and urbanism are about defining sort of uh, public space boundaries. Uh, so I like to start with historic images like this one of a kind of boulevard in Paris uh, with uh, the protagonist sort of strolling down the street. Um, they're participating in a new kind of urban experience, the kind of stroll. Um, and they might be defined as a new sort of uh, urban protagonist, the flaneur, or someone who sort of uh, enjoys the pleasure of sort of walking. Uh, my point is that this type of new urban experience emerged at a certain moment, uh, produced its own sort of cultures um, in terms of social norms, dress codes, social codes, uh, and so on. So um, we can think about, with modernity, what kind of urban protagonists sort of emerged, the flaneur, the window shopper, uh, the kind of exhibitionist, uh, the commuter, the groper, uh, the cell phone addict. Um, and one of our sort of thoughts is that uh, user experience and people's behavior is completely altered by technology. So if we think about the way we sort of interact with others in the public realm today, uh, usually it's mediated interaction. It's not just, you know, hello, you know, I'm taking my hat at you. It's actually, you know, you have a device, they have a device, you might be talking on your device, you might be listening to something. So our hunch is that our social interactions have been sort of significantly altered through technologies in the public realm. So how does architecture sort of uh, incorporate those? How does it participate in those? This is a, a funny slide about, uh, I don't know if it's true, but in China there's a kind of idea that you might have a special lane dedicated to people who are sort of doing this as they walk down the street. So um, we're interested in those ideas, but we're also interested in the, the idea of publicness uh, and um, what is it about the public realm that is un, um, unscripted, you know, a chance encounter, a serendipitous uh, situation, uh, a kind of informal, a kind of the emergence of a kind of group behavior around, say, a street performer. So these are kind of ideas about the public realm, and, and the public realm is highly coded. It's also got rules for what you do in certain places, what you're allowed to do, what you're not allowed to do. And to some extent, we think that our job uh, as architects, as sort of urbanists, is to think about those um, interactions and how do we sort of participate in that? How do we enhance them? How do we create a platform for them? Uh, how do we think about sort of boundaries in the public realm and how does architecture define them? So um, one of our first projects is this one. Uh, it's about personal space. It's a dress that my partner, Mi Jin Yoon, uh, designed when she was um, teaching at MIT. Um, and her hunch was that personal space could be better defined. Uh, and if we use sort of architectural means to sort of define our personal space, uh, we could produce a kind of intimate architecture, an architecture that's worn around the body. Um, and this was the first project that we did in um, 2001. Um, and we argue that this is architectural. You know, so people say, oh, it's fashion. We don't think it's fashion. We think it's architecture because it's about the definition of uh, personal private space between private and public. So um, using that, uh, we also, uh, our second project was this project we did in Athens in 2004 for the Olympics. Uh, and we used the same technology. It was an infrared sensor, uh, an outdoor speaker. Uh, and our hunch was that as you move through public space, you could leave a kind of trace through these sort of fiber optics. Um, and this is a, a video snippet of the installation. As people moved through the field, they were sort of triggering the lights. The lights were sort of flickering on and off. And there was a kind of white noise sound that was sort of um, following you. Uh, so w our hunch was that this was architectural in that it was atmospheric, in that it was sort of uh, defining a sort of space around the user or space around the, the, the person in the public realm. Um, it didn't have a lot of material. It was just fiber optics. Uh, and it had a kind of behavior, which was a kind of response, sort of a code for response. So um, when I walk through, the infrared sensor detects me, and it sends a signal to the speaker. It says, emit white noise, shh, and then light up and sort of flicker. Um, so that's an early project. Uh, we also installed it here in Boston. But it sort of turned us on to this idea that um, design could be more than just material in space. It could actually be uh, behavior. It could be electronics. It could be encoded. 
It could be sound, and it could be light, you know, so super ephemeral. And we sort of uh, started to make our own electronics um, and started to make spaces like this. Uh, and I think that's what sort of launched a kind of uh, a series of projects that we've been continuing to develop um, as our firm. Uh, so our firm does a whole range of different things. On the upper left-hand corner is the Dubai Pavilion that I'll show you a little bit later. Uh, but we do a range of different projects, and I'm going to sort of quickly show you a number of those, just to kind of expand your sort of definition. We also, um, sometimes we like to show like, well, if this is us, uh, this is our firm, and we like to, um, when we present ourselves to clients, we sort of show them like, look, if you hire us, you're not getting a product, you're getting a process, and you're going to get all these people that are sort of committed to a design process. And this is a bit of a kind of glimpse sort of behind the scenes of like, what is the studio like? Uh, but I think sometimes people are interested to see like, you know, what's the kind of messy space of the office uh, and how do you do the work that you do? So we also have a fabrication shop sort of, um, and we do uh, a lot of prototyping. We also like to do a lot of iteration. So talking about process, um, I believe it's as much about the process than it is about the product. Um, one project that we undertook a few years ago on our own was we were curious about wind power. You know, we hear a lot about Cape Wind and sort of uh, clean energy and we understood that there are people that are not, a, not for wind power. And so we said maybe um, it's about, they're worried about the kind of the aesthetics of wind power. You know, maybe it's disrupting the kind of natural ecosystem. So maybe we could produce a more beautiful wind turbine. So we set it upon ourselves to design a, a, a more attractive wind turbine. And we thought maybe it could be like a piece of sculpture. Maybe it's not a machine, maybe it's a piece of sculpture. So um, we made some tests. Uh, we put them on the roof and we sort of observed. I thought the one on the right was the most attractive. Um, but it didn't actually spin very well. Um, and we didn't think it had to be like super optimal, but it had to light up. And, and the one on the right wasn't lighting up. So we actually went for the ones on the left. Uh, we fabricated them ourselves. And we installed this at MIT um, a couple years ago in, in a building called the Green Building. The Green Building is the IMP building. It's a skyscraper on MIT's campus. When it opened, um, there was so much wind pressure on the building, you couldn't open the door. You know, so it's a building that already had suffered in a way from, from wind. Uh, we installed the wind turbines, 400 of them, um, and they created this incredible effect. Um, and people at MIT were like, wow, you know, what's its spell? You know, what's the, where's the computer? And our point was that there was no computer. Each turbine had its own little uh, generator and two LEDs, and as the wind spun, it sort of lit up, and it sort of revealed this kind of um, presence of energy all around us. And so we thought that was kind of interesting to talk about um, energy production and energy consumption in the same place. You know, we hear a lot about sustainability and it's about using less or storing more. Uh, and this was about making more and using more and creating a, a kind of visual effect of energy, making energy visible. And we thought that was kind of a powerful idea. Um, we also um, work around town. We did this project at, uh, in Roxbury. Uh, in front of the new bowling building. Um, it's a sculpture, but it's also a kind of broadcast uh, tool. And we talk about clock towers as being these kind of historic landmarks in cities. Uh, this we call it signal spire because it, it represents all the neighborhoods in Boston. So they're all sort of mapped onto this sort of bundle. Our idea was that together, Boston is made up of different neighborhoods. If you take 311 data, which is the, you know, the app that you sort of punch in, it's like, oh, there's a pothole over here, or that street light isn't working punch in that data and it creates an extremely rich data set. And we thought, hmm, maybe we can grab that data and use that data as a real-time content for our sculpture. Um, so um, we, um, we worked with some clever people at SoSo -So Limited uh, to translate all that open source data into a, um, a visual display. So constant real-time data is being broadcast into the sculpture. Um, and it's sort of taking data and sort of producing this kind of burst of light. So as a citizen, you walk by the sculpture and you're like, oh, it's sort of lighting up, it's creating this interesting signal. Um, it's also something that you can sort of um, uh, engage with your cell phone. So if you sort of walk by and you tweet hashtag signal spire, uh, that will sort of unlock a certain behavioral pattern that we call it the jackpot mode. So this is typical mode. Um, and then uh, if you get it right, signal spire, you can get this whole thing to kind of explode in light. So on some level, it's just sort of constantly sort of taking data sets and sort of broadcasting them. On another level, it's one-to-one -one interactive. So if you sort of tweet the right thing, you can sort of 
um, get this sort of burst of, of light. So we, we do a lot of fabrication, so we figured out, you know, how do we perforate the tubes, uh, how do we sort of assemble them, uh, and then ultimately install them in a place. But I think the success of the project is that it somehow reveals uh, in real time a kind of interaction between citizens and the city uh, through a kind of light, light, uh, light display. Um, okay, um, we like to think about, you know, I said interfaces, and so we think about the screen on your phone, right? You think about the monitor that you work on. Our point is that everything is always already sort of um, mediated through some sort of interface. Uh, so thinking about uh, other projects that we've done that deal with this idea of interface, um, we did a project on the U.S.-Mexico border, um, a topic that's getting a lot of attention these days. Um, this border has 26 lanes, uh, and they were uh, building a new border crossing. Uh, and we said, why don't we take, every time a car drives through, we'll take that as a kind of input. And then for every time a car drives through, we'll create a kind of burst of light. You know, because sometimes you can wait there for six hours, you know, waiting to cross the border. And you're like, is it moving? I don't know. But this sort of feedback would say, like, yeah, it's moving. Uh, and in fact, um, we developed a script that would sort of basically take the data sets of people driving through, create a new kind of signal as this one pixel. It's, it's an aspect ratio of one pixel by 600 feet. Um, so that uh, is what we built on the border. Uh, and basically, we think it's, it's a kind of screen. Uh, it's an extreme proportion. Uh, it's communicating. It's communicating that there's flow happening, right? It's communicating that people are passing through here, that the border is, in fact, porous. That's actually part of everyday life. A lot of people live on different sides of the border and pass through. It's a normal thing. Uh, and I think it points out kind of the insanity of the idea of, uh, of a wall. You know, why would we build a wall? Uh, that rhetoric is so dangerous and so uh, toxic. Uh, the fact is the borders do uh, process a lot of people, and that flow is real, and that flow is necessary. And here we're sort of visualizing that flow. So a very modest project, but it does sort of communicate without language the idea of porosity, of a kind of welcoming uh, through this sort of signal that's happening. So we think it's architects' job also to think about you know, how do we sort of visualize that kind of situation. Um, we did a project a couple years ago. You might know it uh, at the convention center, the Lawn on D. We proposed a set of swings. Uh, we call it public play. Um, have you guys been? Have you been down there? Um, the owners of the convention center are planning on this billion dollar expansion, right? And they're saying, how do we sort of plan for all this urban growth? Maybe we need um, something to anchor it. Maybe we need a public space, you know? And so I think smartly, instead of just building a bunch of housing and hoping people will buy it, they said, let's make a park. And so we, we were part of that park that sort of anchors the neighborhood that brings people together in a way raises the value of some of that real estate. So instead of like, renting an apartment or buying an apartment just in Southie, you're renting an apartment you know, across the street from the Lawn on D. And Lawn on D is essentially, it's a piece of lawn, uh, but there is a kind of uh, playful uh, sort of public art piece here. Uh, and our idea was, let's make play something not just for kids, let's make play something for adults. Uh, let's let people play in ways that are smart, that you get feedback. So I don't know if you noticed, but um, as you swing, the swings turn pink. And then as they stay still, they're blue, and then they go pink again. Uh, and that's a very basic feedback. That's something we learned when we were working in Athens, that people want this feedback. They want to know that their environment understands, responds, is aware of their presence. So very simple uh, interaction. This is something that we prototyped in our shop. So here, sort of CNC cutting uh, polypropylene flat sheets, programming Arduinos, uh, making a little microcontroller, and then welding the plastic into these rings. Uh, something we prototyped in our office, uh, assembled, uh, and then deployed. So an architecture firm sort of making interactive swings. Um, I think it had a tremendous impact uh, on the park. I think it wouldn't be as fun without the swings. Uh, it wouldn't be as fun without the beer garden, too. Um, they do have a beer garden right next to it. Um, but it was a great place for people to gather, to take pictures. Uh, last year, we added the PVs. So we took it off the grid. We sort of built a canopy and said it's all going to be uh, solar powered. So again, this idea of like production and consumption of energy. You can produce energy locally. You can consume it locally. It's off the grid. Uh, we can have sustainability and pleasure at the same time. Uh, sometimes it's like this. I don't know if you've been out there. When it's like this, it's really kind of hard to get a swing. 
Um, sometimes people behave like this. Um, and so we made up rules. We said, you know what, you can swing like this, you can swing like that, but don't swing like this. And it's amazing the things that people do on the swings. Uh, we like to sort of watch uh, and collect images of people uh, behaving and misbehaving on the swings. Um, and we think it's actually interesting as architects to think about not just buildings, but as to behavior. You know, how do we design a kind of behavior for people? And I think this is a kind of sign of success where people go, they have fun, they interact in different ways. We've affected their behavior through our design, and that's the kind of satisfaction that we get. Um, okay, I'm gonna show you the Dubai Pavilion. This is something that, um, as George mentioned, was a collaboration with Todd Macover. Todd is a composer in the Media Lab, um, and he was asked to compose a work, uh, like an opera, uh, to encourage empathy. Uh, and we were working with him to design a pavilion for empathy, so it was a sort of housing a certain performance. Um, Dubai um, is having the 2020 Expo. They've identified sites, uh, they've identified thematic pavilions for sustainability, for mobility, for opportunity. Uh, we were gonna do one called Empathy, um, and we really wanted it to be a place where in 45 minutes you would go through, you would be introduced to a series of uh, groups, a series of um, activities, and through that 45 minute period you would be taught how to sort of produce empathy. The idea that empathy is not just an emotion, it's actually a kind of neurological condition that can be actually researched, it can be uh, learned, it can be engineered. Uh, so our job was to sort of script that series of, of events that would happen inside this pavilion um, both on the inside and on the outside. Uh, so working with Todd, we developed the different scenarios where you would sort of meet in small groups and then bigger groups and end with a great big performance. At the same time, we worked with engineers to figure out what's it like to build in Dubai? You know, what can we do in terms of the incredible heat, the incredible um, solar radiation? Uh, and so we created this design that had a series of big overhangs. We thought if we could create these big balconies, uh, the spaces would be self-shading. We thought that as you exited the building, you would actually come down these sort of balconies. And so the transition from inside to outside, from interior world to exterior world would be eased. Um, and we learned, and these are some of the plans, we learned that um, creating these overhangs could uh, produce the self-shading, which would lower the temperature. And so as you sort of exited the building from a condition to a semi-condition to a shaded, unconditioned space, that that transition would be somehow uh, buffered. Uh, we worked with a number of fantastic engineers, um, structural engineers to sort of work out the sort of structures of it, um, as well as environmental engineers to think about the different uh, atmospheric conditions within the spaces. So, so we were sort of choreographing not just the sound and the light and the images, but also the atmospheric conditions. Um, and thinking about the, the kind of environmental forces, like what is the sort of solar heat gain on those shaded terraces uh, over the course of the day and over the course of the year. Uh, we thought no direct light, just completely indirect light through the risers of some of these um, sort of cutouts. Uh, and some of the views uh, below uh, and within, and this is the final sort of performance space uh, that you would have right before you get sort of uh, pushed out onto the balconies, um, here and then here. So designing for empathy, um, designing for social interaction, I think that's part of our scope. Um, I think this is the last project I'm gonna show and then I think George and I are gonna have a discussion. Um, we recently proposed um, a structure that would float in the river in Philadelphia, in the Schuylkill River. Um, the idea was to bring people to the river uh, and allow them to experience the river in a new way. Uh, if you know Philadelphia, it's sort of between two rivers. Historically, the city had sort of relied on the rivers for industry. Um, and I think since that time, the rivers, you see some of the industrial landscape of Philadelphia, the city sort of turns back on the river and, and the river was polluted. And so we thought, how do we bring people back to the waterfront, back to sort of witness uh, the kind of environmental uh, improvement of the river, uh, to learn about the sort of urban nature and the sort of local ecology of the riverfront. So we wanted to create experiences like this where someone could actually come to the river, witness the kind of um, remediation over time of the sort of water quality and the, and the kind of urban uh, uh, ecology. So uh, we pitched this idea um, to uh, Philadelphia's mural arts program. Uh, and we said, we think we can do this. We think we can create a submarine that we can sort of pump water into it and it'll sort of sink down into the river to produce that sort of eye level view. Uh, we did some uh, testing in the sink. Uh, we did some mock-ups with the Naval architect. 
uh, we talked about sort of the ballasting, basically pumping water in, pumping water out to get this sort of submarine to sort of sink down to that right level. Uh, and we also, um, in order to convince our client, we said, why don't we make one? So we proposed a mock-up, um, an 8x8x15 eight eight steel mock-up, uh, which we fabricated. We took to uh, the river, we dropped it in, and then we sort of slowly filled it with water. So it sort of dropped down. Uh, to give you that experience, this is Zach. He was sort of in the ballast tank, uh, making sure that it was filling up properly, uh, producing a kind of calibrated um, capsizing, essentially, lowering it down. Uh, we had a small leak, um, which was filled. But this was the sort of moment we wanted to produce, this idea that you can sort of be at eye level with the river, out in the river, uh, experiencing it differently, impacting your sort of ecological consciousness, sort of not just sort of telling you to sort of um, you know, turn off the AC, but actually give you an experience that would sort of create a lasting impression to sort of work on the kind of um, ecological literacy of individuals. Uh, and this was the final um, prototype. Uh, we just got $2 million of funding to do the full one. So the full one is the big ring that has a ramp instead of this one, which is just steps. But this is one way to sort of convince uh, the donors that this was viable technically, but also necessary um, environmentally. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Well, Eric, that is just fantastic stuff. I, I, some of which I knew and some of which I didn't. Uh, yeah. So um, there's a lot of ways in here, but I, first of all, you, you can imagine um, in teaching a course on sort of design thinking, when I saw that you guys were doing an empathy pavilion, I thought, this can't be. <laughs> you know, it's just like, are you also doing one on the other stages of, uh, <laughs> of ideas kind of outlined? <laughs> um, but I, I, I want to start with a question about that. And mm -hmm. then there's a bunch of uh, other things we can talk about. But so the context for the Empathy Pavilion is a kind of World's Fair type of yep. thing. Mm -hmm. And so what are, the, uh, what, what are the, some of the other uh, pavilions that are uh, being considered? There's, there's three. There's sustainability, mobility, and opportunity. Okay. Uh, those are the three main. Then there are the national pavilions. Right. So you know the U.S., you know Germany, all, it's China. They all have their own independent pavilions. I think these are incredible platforms. You know, if you think about the the, the World's Fair in Chicago, technologies are introduced. Yeah. Um, spectacle is introduced. Mm -hmm. You know, the Ferris wheel, the Eiffel Tower, mm -hmm. uh, popcorn. Um, ice cream floats, these are mm -hmm. all things that were technologies and cultures that were introduced at World's Fair. So it's an incredible debut moment. Mm -hmm. um, I think Dubai has a reputation for being uh, a kind of Las Vegas of the Middle East. It's, mm -hmm. it's where kind of s uh, social codes are relaxed just enough mm -hmm. to sort of attract uh, people locally in the region and, and, and globally. Um, Dubai has an opportunity to sort of burnish its reputation a little bit, to show itself as a leader. Mm -hmm. uh, there's plenty of questions about the kind of you know, the urbanism they're producing, the labor rules that they're, they're operating under. So there's, there is an opportunity there to sort of recast mm -hmm. a kind of image of Dubai. Um, and the, our client um, was the Minister of State. Um, and she was determined that an empathy pavilion would be uh, important to create better understanding between individuals. Mm -hmm. um, thinking about that in the context of the Middle East, where mm -hmm. so many social codes are already so complex. Mm -hmm. you know, we thought we could do something called T for two, where we'd have groups of two interacting first, and then you join a, a larger group. Said, no, 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 you can't have tea for two. <laughs> it's too intimate, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, very interesting um, social context to work in. Uh, a fa fantastic ambition, you mm -hmm. know? If we, I mean, they were asking us nothing less than kind of world peace, you right, know? Right, if we could right. all understand each other better, then we could have a more, a more peaceful world. And there was a real earnest desire for people to have a better understanding, overcoming all kinds of cultural difference. And Think about the news today. You know, you just think we desperately need this. Right, we need right. this kind of group uh, sort of training in in how to um, understand people better. Mm. I, it's it is fascinating. I, I I went to the World Ex Exposition in Shanghai in 2010, yep. and uh, it was it is very interesting. There's there's the individual pavilions of the countries, and then there's always uh, in this case I don't know that they were themed, but but they there was one that was a, a history of all the world expositions up to that point, which was fantastic for exactly the reason you suggest, that it, yeah. they really capture a kind of moment of international collaboration 
through history, yeah. through the last 120 years, probably, or yeah. 160 years, something like that. Um, well, that's, that's, really, that's really interesting. More, more broadly, the, um, the role that interactivity plays in your and your wife's firm uh, probably can't be overstated, and I think it is not typical of an average architecture firm in the United States. So, like, l let me let me enter this uh, this way. Um, most of the students in this uh, class are not design students; they're, okay. they're students from all over the university. So, I'll, I'll, a little bit of context. Eric has worked the, the two firms that Eric work for, worked for early in his career. I would say it's pretty hard to find two that are more different at at high end at a high high level, right? So one is Diller and Scafidio, which when I was younger was, was almost exclusively installations and really more of an art uh, firm that dealt with the built environment but, but from a very uh, conceptual perspective. So that's one end of the spectrum. And then the other end of the spectrum is a very high-end corporate firm called Cone Pedersen Fox, which does market-driven uh, uh, large commercial projects, lots of high-rises, which are, you know, probably coincided with when, when you did that little, that book. Mm -hmm. um, but those seem like very, almost the opposite ends of the spectrum in there. How is that, how did that influence the, your own development? Because it seems like, it, it looks like it could have. Yeah, I mean, um, I was at KPF for almost eight years, so it was not a small amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, and I went there after graduation, and I'd, I'd grown up in, in, in Thailand, um, mm -hmm. in Southeast Asia, and I saw Bangkok sort of booming in the 80s, and I actually thought, well, you know, I want to I want to participate in that. So, I went to New York mm -hmm. uh, to participate in the building boom in, in Asia, <laughs> right. uh, and I built uh, I don't know 15 tall buildings in Asia during the time I was there. Um, very very interesting. Um, I realized that we were operating in a context that we didn't really know, mm -hmm. uh, without a theoretical framework. Mm -hmm. We were just sort of following market forces, and mm -hmm. and that was part of the impetus to write the book, which is how do we design a theory about working in these different global contexts. So, it, you know, you don't think of KPF as a particularly theoretical practice, mm -hmm. but there was theory in applied. You know, there was, a, there was a kind of practice without a theory. And so, I found that really interesting to think about cross-cultural um, design right. um, and to think about our role as producing these sort of iconic structures, you know. Think about the Shanghai World Financial Center. Think about the Jinmao building. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. powerful things. And I found ways to sort of bring theory in uh, mm -hmm. for myself just mm -hmm. because I, I needed something to, mm -hmm. to keep my brain going. When I left KPF to go to Diller Scafidio, I'd always admired their work. Uh, and this was a moment where I had an opportunity to contribute to the ICA Museum here in Boston. Mm -hmm. They were putting together a team to build that building. They needed people that had done drawings before, mm -hmm. um, drawings of buildings. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, <laughs> and, um, and they could speak their language. And I felt like they hired me because I was conversant with their kind of way of thinking and talking about architecture but had an experience that was very pragmatically mm -hmm. applicable right. uh, to the task at hand. Um, starting my own practice, um, you know, we, our first commission was like a two-story building. You know, it's not a skyscraper and it's not a, uh, a museum, right, you know? Right, and right. so uh, how do you sort of develop your own voice having worked in these contexts where, you know, to some extent budgets were, were quite healthy and, mm -hmm. and, and um, prominent projects. So in the last 11 years, that I've been in Boston working, we've tried to sort of find our own way. You know, certainly the influence of Diller Scafidio, more subtle the influence of Cone Pedersen Fox, influence of mentors mm -hmm. uh, in town and, and elsewhere. Um, I think it's really about finding a way to be in the world as a designer. Mm -hmm. You know, what are the issues you will take on? What are the opportunities you could contribute to? Um, I think there are traces in there yeah. somewhere. No, no, I, I, th <laughs> I, I, th I think very much so, actually. I mean, I, I, I think there's so many, um, themes that we've touched on already, one of them is um, your own ex your own d growth as a person in lots of different places. You say you grew up in Thailand, you were born in, in South America. Um, you do work both here and abroad now. Mm -hmm. um, does that, do you think there's a, do you think you guys bring a particular point of view to, to work in the U.S. versus work in other places? Um, hmm. Or, or is it simply each place is really e each place is really different, and therefore yeah. I mean, we try to be very situational. We try not to bring any sort of uh, pre pre 
preconceptions with us. Mm -hmm. uh, we're working in Germany for Audi. Mm -hmm. uh, we did that project in Dubai. Um, we've done work in China. Uh, so each context is a little different. I, I'm perfectly happy to work in these different places. It's very exciting. I like the kind of cross-cultural sort of um, exchanges. Yeah. Uh, they can be incredibly um, uh, productive. They can be incredibly frustrating. Yeah. Plenty of stories about working in China, working in Dubai. Um, but ultimately, I think it's, um, you know, as a young firm, I think of ourselves still as young. Right. You know, we go where the opportunities are, right. where we can be impactful, and where we can, you know, um, uh, you know, realize things in the world and test things in the world. So uh, it's a little bit opportunistic um, where if someone calls from um, Argentina tomorrow, mm -hmm. we'll go. Right. You know, right. we, don't, we don't have the luxury of, of, uh, of picking our clients. Well, I wanted to ask you about that because given your – Given the kind of hybrid interests that you guys seem to have, and um, you know, on the continuum between what I would define as sort of an artist at one end and a designer at the other end, an artist getting to, let's say, create the terms of their own production, a designer responding to external, it, this is broad, a broad generalization, but I think largely true, mm -hmm. a designer responding to the needs of someone else, uh, uh, someone else with empathy and, and understanding, where do you guys see yourselves in that continuum? Is that a is that a reasonable? Uh, I mean, is that how you guys look at yourselves? Or yeah, we use the word designer a lot. Um, you know, for a while we would be asked in contexts of like, like architecture schools, we would say designer, and someone would say, "Don't you mean architect?" Right, right. And I would say, "Yeah, I mean, designer." Yeah. Um, but <laughs> our argument was that architecture needed to be expanded, and yeah. that's why we worked on that book, expanded right. practice. How do we sort of broaden the terms of architectural practice to incorporate the dress and the master plan, the microcontroller, mm -hmm. and the behavior? Mm -hmm. So um, we fought, you know, for the first six years or so to sort of expand what we defined as architecture. Mm -hmm. um, there's a word architecture in our firm, but more and more we start thinking about ourselves as, as designers in the broadest sense, right. you know, because I think we have an ability to impact things at the scale of the kind of urban, mm -hmm. at the scale of, of um, you know, the, the interpersonal. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, we, we kind of struggle with that, with that term. Interestingly, you can get away with a lot as an artist. You know? mm -hmm. If you go to a client as the artist and you say, I want it to be, I want it to rain over there, you know, and they're like, okay, well, we'll, we'll figure out how to do that. Yeah. If you say, I'm an architect and I want it to rain over there, they're like, yeah. you know, we can't afford that, you right, know. Right, you know right, so. Right. Uh, there's different sort of ways people perceive you depending on what title you have after your name. Right. Um, We're going to have a couple of uh, conceptual artists from MIT over later in the uh, uh, later in this semester. I, I, I'm not going to say their names because they're, they're complicated to pronounce, and I'll, I'll, I'll surely get it wrong. Uh -huh. But they're they're from uh, they're they're from the, the Center for Visual Arts. Uh, yeah, there. I think I know who you mean. Um, and uh, so, speaking of MIT. Um, how many of you are familiar with the, I don't think you showed, the, you didn't show the Collier Memorial. No. no. So how many of you are familiar with, uh, have you been to MIT's campus? So you know perhaps that um, there is now a memorial uh, to the MIT police officer who was killed as a result of the marathon bombings here in uh, 2013, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Eric and his partner, uh, Lee Jin Yoon, are the ones who designed this memorial. And it's very, I, I want to I mention it just because um, we ju I just gave a talk on memorials uh, mm -hmm. and how they have migrated historically from being more objects of static veneration to now things that are much more experiential. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that, you know, Maya Lim is probably like the, in some ways, the pivotal person in that transition. Yeah. Um, but another thing we talked about when we were talking about memorials, which I find absolutely fascinating, is the whole question of time. So if you think about the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C., it was built, you know, uh, at least two or three generations after Lincoln's death. Uh, if you think about the World War II Memorial, two generations after the end of World War II or three. Um, and uh, now the Vietnam Veterans Memorial was built very soon after the Vietnam, after the American involvement in Vietnam ended, um, only five years, six years, let's say. Mm -hmm. In your case, doing the memorial to the slain MIT police officer happened within a year almost, mm -hmm. didn't it? 
Well, there was a desire to open on the second anniversary of the event. And so the first year, there was a lot of um, you know, thinking and discussing, and there was a kind of open call for um, competition entries. Um, and um, then they asked Mijin to design the memorial, taking into account this binder full of uh, ideas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so it did happen fairly quickly, mm. um, but it was, it was a real challenge because MIT said we want something that's uniquely MIT, right. you know, and how could it be um, rethink the idea of memorial. And you know, I think people were hoping that we would do something ephemeral, something electronic, something mm -hmm. potentially light and and tech techy. Mm -hmm. um, and we applied technology, I think, in very particular ways. But it's in a way, it's massive right, and right, heavy, right, right. And, and in a way traditional. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. But I like to say it's a thousand-year-old sort of technology because it's an arch mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and a vault. Uh, but it's cut by a robot that has a tolerance that's sort of. Um, the most uh, highly calibrated robot you could imagine. So right, right. Um, it did bring up lots of very interesting issues, um, the status of memory at a time where everyone has a device. You know, right, what, right. Is, what is the role of memory in that context? Um, and we still think there is something about coming to a place and experiencing something in your, in your gut, mm -hmm. uh, which architecture can do. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Maybe your phone can do that too, but I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, here's the thing. This is what's, I think, absolutely fascinating, especially for this class, about um, talking about memorials. Because when you, when, you, when you apply the sort of IDO, Stanford Design School sort of mantra of, of empathize and, and define the problem or understand the problem and ideate and prototype and test, we can talk a bit more about prototyping in a second because I know that's very germane for you. But re-understanding or reimagining what the problem it is that you are solving in a memorial is, I think, so fascinating because I was thinking early, as I was thinking about questions um, last night and this morning, um, the, the whole question of what a memorial is really supposed to do, I would argue, in many ways, you were designing a memorial in a way almost in, a, in the time frame of journalism. Not to say, not to say history. Do you know what I mean? It's almost like real-time reporting of how we feel about this thing. Mm -hmm. And obviously, you had to you had to try to overcome that, I'm sure, because because the real job of a memorial, in the end, is for people who weren't there. Yeah. You know, you go to you you, you know you go to. Uh, I've told the students before. I spent a lot of time in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. My father grew up there, and as a boy, I would go to visit my grandparents, and the eager fathers and grandfathers and uncles would take me through the battlefield because it's so edifying, it's so, it's so didactic. Mm -hmm. um, but they are, all those monuments to the, all the different regiments, there's hundreds of memorials in Gettysburg, not, not one, hundreds, because they're each by regiment uh, of the Northern team and the Southern team. And, um, you know, they're there to tell, to, to, to mark witness, to tell the story. Everybody's dead. Everybody who had anything to do with anything there is dead. So there's nobody to tell you. You can read books, but these are these are a, like a solemn memory. And so you were, you and Maya Lin also were asked in a way to do the opposite of what most memorial designers do, which is to predict in the future mm -hmm. how, what our take on this will be about the past. Yeah. Is that? I mean, I think that's fascinating. It's so different because most of the time. Memorials have been done, actually, at least in this country, um, several generations afterwards. Only after, okay, I think we understand what the impact of the First World War was, or I think now we can say something about Korea. Mm. So um, I'm, I'm very interested in this topic, um, the status of memory in architecture. Um, and I think we've seen a kind of rush recently to memorialize uh, different groups, mm -hmm. uh, you know, on the Washington Mall specifically. Sure. This is a kind of platform for different groups to uh, articulate a kind of uh, part of history. Sure. Um, a few years ago, when I was in grad school, the Holocaust Memorial was built in, on the mall. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was a huge sense of urgency to build it before the last survivors you know, were gone. Mm -hmm. you know, and I think that was a kind of a sense that uh, we needed to sort of capture a certain moment at that you know, before they, before right, they were right. gone, before their stories were locked. So I think there is something about urgency and memory. Um, we, 
recently interviewed at UVA to do a memorial for the enslaved laborers. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And that is a huge deal. This mm. is the university that Thomas Jefferson built mm -hmm. that inscribes the ideals of an American architecture, yet it is completely fraught with sure. all kinds of difficult histories. Uh, and they want to acknowledge those histories and build a memorial for the slaves that built the physical stuff right. of the campus. So um, in that context, when we interviewed they asked us to think about uh, how will this uh, both respect the grounds, mm -hmm. which are sort of in a way hallowed, how will it sort of uh, manage the kind of difficult history uh, and the difficult narratives. Mm -hmm. You know, there is a Confederate war memorial in Charlottesville. Mm -hmm. Robert E. Lee stands on right, a horse right. in a park, you know, a stone throw from the side of the yeah. memorial. So um, they asked us a similar question, you know, how do you sort of manage those, those conflicting narratives how do you anticipate how this memorial will be perceived in the future by future generations? Right. Um, and in the interview, I, I, I had a thought, and I, I was thinking about um, my friend Jorge Otero Pailos, mm -hmm. who teaches at Columbia in preservation, and he has a journal called uh, Future Anterior, which is a preservation journal mm -hmm. uh, that asks us to think about the, what we do now as if we were in the future looking back right. at the present. Right. And I think it's an interesting idea, you know, so I suggested that we might think about memorialization as a future interior, you mm -hmm. know. The new memorial that we would propose would be regarded in a hundred years in hindsight. How would we anticipate that reception? Um, and it's incredibly hard um, mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. to speculate about that, um, what the status of memory would be then. The question was really a question about how do you sort of think about the context of UVA with its cohesive architecture, with its sort of legacy, uh, and how do you respect that mm -hmm. while adding something to it? Right. And I think we're very conscious of a kind of tradition and a kind of lineage of incremental um, construction mm -hmm. over time and an in mm -hmm. incremental e evolution of consciousness. You right, know? Right, right, right. So uh, it is one of those incredibly um, challenging intellectual projects that I think we're very well suited for. Right. Well, you know, speaking of which, you guys should be very involved. There's such an interesting discussion about especially memorials in the South that really somehow really came to fore after that terrible shooting in Charleston where the um, white, young white supremacist murdered nine uh, black churchgoers in a church last year, maybe. Um, and, you know, suddenly, Finally, a lot of people in the South said, you know, maybe we shouldn't actually have memorials to uh, uh, white supremacists from the Civil War era dotting our landscape. But uh, someone I, uh, you wouldn't know, he's not an architect, but wrote a very thoughtful piece about this, and I think it, it, it speaks very much to your, your friend's journal and this notion of looking at these things from a point in time other than your own. Mm -hmm. And that is, maybe what we should be doing is either adding to or contextualizing these monuments, not tearing them down. There was a, there was a movement, you know, they should all be torn down like, you know, with a, with a uh, very videotaped with a bulldozer and all the rest. But first of all, it would be politically complicated. But second of all, the idea of incremental change, mm -hmm. even in things that are uh, seen to be monumental at one time is, is I think, a ver really powerful idea, and it would be a lovely um, project for somebody to sort of take on, either academically or, or as a kind of conversation starter, to say, what, what do we do with the 500, 2,000 of these memorials? You know, let's map them, let's identify where they are. What is the story that is currently being told? Mm -hmm. How would we like that story to read differently without erasing what's been written. I think that's a... Yeah, I think that's the right approach, uh, the kind of reframing of histories, um, not through erasure, but actually through sort of repositioning them. Um, I think the South is, is littered with these memorials. Um, I think, you know, taking down the flag, I think is, is a productive right, first step. Right, right. Um, but also sort of using these as teachable moments, you know, right. and how do we use uh, the the architectural and urban landscape as a series of lessons to be to be conveyed. And right. I think that's one of the hardest things we struggle with is, you know, architecture has content, mm -hmm. you know, it's not always explicit, right. you know, and and um, I think 
architecture I try to show has the capacity to broadcast. It is a broadcast medium. We right. do reach audiences beyond beyond the immediate audiences, and so particularly with a tall building. Mm -hmm. So um, how do we think very hard about how does architecture broadcast, what its content is, what its lesson is? Um, so I think that is one thing that's true for, for the skyscraper, for the building, for the memorial. There's a content um, to be delivered. Right. And, and in a way, the, the structure is a vehicle for that delivery. Mm -hmm. um, we're working with Mabel Wilson from Columbia, who is a very prominent uh, African-American historian, scholar. Uh, we're working with the landscape architect. We're, you know, we're forming these committees. It, I think it's going to be an incredible. This is for the UVA thing. Yeah. 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 And I, you know, architects, we think that we're equipped to deal with these things, but we actually need to partner yeah. with all kinds of different experts. And I think that comes to the kind of question of interdisciplinarity. Right. You know, you can do a lot as an architect, as a designer, but you also need to know how to partner right. and partner with people that are experts that, that will bring things to the table, mm -hmm. like the historians, like the community organizers that we're talking to. This, what you're describing in Virginia could easily be a case study in, in a, we're using as a text um, Tim Brown's uh, Change by Design. Mm -hmm. It's a 2009 book, but it's a, he at the time was, uh, was the head of IDM. And, and it's really, it's great because it tells the story of how exactly that sort of operation, interdisciplinary, um, really trying to approach problems with a, an open mind and doing some real research, broadening op options, and then having techniques for narrowing down towards solutions. Um, so so it, it couldn't be more, more relevant. I should stress, we're gonna have so, uh, at least one other architect um, in this series, uh, Blake Middleton, um, uh, who is much, who's a great architect, but he's much more operating in the traditional framework of, of uh, market-driven architecture. And I think it's, it's, it's amazing that you guys have been able to Secure such a footing of across disciplines. I think it's 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 really to be to be lauded. I I am curious if there are building types. Or uh, I know you're saying you're, you guys are so hungry for work, but are there building types that you haven't been able to do yet that you'd really like to? You know, for a long time we had two parallel paths: the kind of uh, interactive um, and installational, and then the kind of more traditional structures, mm -hmm. um, and I think the Dubai Pavilion was a moment of convergence where the kind of media architecture and the architecture architecture would collide and mm -hmm. to produce a full uh, atmospheric sort of immersive mm -hmm. um, experience. So that that was a kind of a dream, um, a dream project. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, to, to sort of manifest the kind of content aspect of architecture, I think programs that have content, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Performing arts, media centers, mm -hmm. um, you know, but I, I would say we're not prejudiced about you know building right. types. You know, the tall building is something that that is still uh, attractive. Sure. Um, and it, I like to think of it as a as a broadcast medium, right. having a responsibility at the scale the size that I need to do. But uh, we're still working on that. Well, you know that I've been. I, I think I told you I've been talking you up with Tony Penguin also. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, not that you need that. Um, so, um, regarding uh, a, a couple more points about like prototyping, fabrication, um, you, it's clear, and you showed some examples, but maybe you weren't focusing on the prototyping um, and how that plays a role in your practice that let's say it just didn't when you started your professional career. I mean, I, I think the, the, I didn't know anything about the Schuylkill River project, the last one you showed, which was just fascinating, very cool. Um, and I love that you had to prove the, that somebody said, well, before we spend a few million dollars on this, I think let's make sure this isn't just gonna be like the USS Monitor or one of those Civil War subs that just like yeah. fires one shot and sinks. Uh -huh. um, how do you, do you guys do much, I mean, being associated with MIT and with Harvard, you have access to more kind of prototyping capacity than maybe the average firm does, but do you do you do a lot of that? Do you do a lot of testing and prototyping? We do. I mean, um, we have a shop. We have all the equipment you would want, a CNC, laser cutter, 3D printer, everything that you would need. Uh, a lot of tools, right. table saw, band saw, everything you would need, high tech, low tech. Mm -hmm. um, so we like to, to test things. Um, and I think sometimes a client needs to see something, mm -hmm. you know, the swing, 
as an idea, the rendering was fine, but mm -hmm. if you get them to sit in it and mm -hmm. get them to swing in it, and literally we would set up this thing in the office, the client would come, they would sit in it, they would swing on it, and they would give us feedback right. saying, right. oh, it's a little bit too soft here, or right. the light isn't distributing well here. So right. I think that project was a great example of something where if you have an idea, you sort of physicalize it, you materialize it, you can present it in a very compelling way, and that becomes a reality. You know, how do you make that? Right. How do you make it real? Uh, at the end of the day, we physically made them all, and we installed them all. I think in the future, we'd like to make a prototype right. of someone else do of the course. production. Um, so that's a, a line we draw. We get a lot of requests to remake the swings, and we say, well, we'll think about that. But mm -hmm. we're, we're not in the business of swing making. We're in the business of design. And so we like to think that uh, we can make prototypes, but someone else would make the, the production. Um, the submarine, something like that, you sort of need to prove it. Yeah, right? They yeah, don't yeah. really believe that it's a good idea until you put them in there. Even to yourself, probably. Yeah, I think we, we want to know that it works, right, um, right. that it's not going to sink to the bottom. And so um, I think we, we're big believers in, in testing, empirical testing. You learn so much just watching people interact with things. Right. You know? And so we say even after the project's finished, we'd like to observe how they behave around it. Because usually we're proving wrong. Mm. We think people will do this and they won't. They'll actually do something completely different. Well, this is something that Brown, Tim Brown focuses a lot on, the how important it is to observe um, rather than uh, survey. If you ask people, you know, it's, just like, it's just like political surveys. If you ask them in writing to tell, uh, say all the details of what they think, they'll tell you what they think they're supposed to say. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's just the same with, uh, you know, they could be uh, exercising all kinds of workarounds for some, for some designed experience, and they've just sublimated the fact that they're even doing it. Yeah. You know? um, and if you can watch them get frustrated or be, uh, have a physically awkward kind of interaction, then you, can, you, then you know what you're trying to do. Yeah, no, I think there is a tradition of that kind of observation. You know, William H. White you know, mm -hmm. used to sort of video people in public parks in New York and sort of observe how they, they would drag their chairs mm -hmm. around. And, mm -hmm. you know, and he sort of came up with a list of things that, that you know, good public spaces you know, must have, you know, movable furniture, right, you know, right. uh, those, those kind of things. Um, and you know, I feel like that type of research sort of tapered off for a while. You know, it's not new, it's, mm -hmm. it's just smart mm -hmm. you know, to bring mm -hmm. that kind of observation back in. Architects tend to w photograph the building and then walk away. Right. Um, and I think if you can hang around and assess it, how people are actually using it, that would be productive, I think, for yeah. everybody. Well, you know, um, a lot in architecture schools, this firm isn't talked about that much, but, you know, Gensler continues to be, like, at the top of the class in terms of firms that really integrate what I would call design thinking and also life cycle kinds of uh, management. So that designing buildings is one part of their long relationship with the people that they, they work with. And I think that is something that a lot of other firms e e could, could emulate. That is to making it, foregrounding it and making it part of the whole enterprise rather than an exception. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, we, we do hire a lot of engineers. For the submarine, we hired a naval architect, a uh, naval engineer, to do the buoyancy calculations. Um, we worked with them to produce the shop drawings for the fabricators. Um, many, you know, architects work with, you know, architects are sort of martial forces, you know, structural, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, fire protection, IT, security, um, AV, acoustics, you know, code. Those are the standard set of consultants. We often bring sound composers. We bring com computer programmers. Mm -hmm. We bring you know, fabrication uh, specialists. Uh, for the Collier Memorial, we had five different structural engineering firms sort of That's working amazing. on it. So um, we like to collaborate. We say we're kind of promiscuous sort of mm -hmm. collaborators because there's plenty out there that we don't know. Um, but there's plenty of things we want to do. So mm -hmm. we kind of trespass into, into lighting design, into landscape design. But we try to then bring in experts that will help us do it effectively. Um, so yeah, we like to bring in uh, expertise uh, specific to the to the projects. Um, you know, uh, you know, for for an, a stone arch, you need a particular kind of consultant. Mm -hmm. You know, that mm -hmm. kind of expertise is kind of 
hard to come by, except that there's a professor at MIT whose PhD dissertation was on Inca stonework, you know, and so uh, the idea of full compression structures was part of his sort of design research agenda. So um, that was a fortuitous um, uh, collaboration. Um, but I think for, for unusual things, um, like submarines and arches and vaults, I think having experts is so important. You know, architects often bite off more than they can chew. Um, and um, I think it is important to bring in those, those experts. Um, you need to sort of push the project mm -hmm. forward, but I think then you need to sort of backfill with expertise so that you're not out there. <laughs> well, that's, that's, I'm, that's, uh, I've always believed in um, over-promising and then backfilling with content before anybody notices that you've overpromised. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, yeah. Like when they when they when they first went up. When they first went up, like five or six guys would climb on them. They would spin them around, and eventually they would break. You right. know, and so they kept breaking, uh, and so we kept redesigning the connection to sort of limit the amount of rotation. You know, five guys on a swing that's five foot in diameter creates an enormous amount of torque. You know, so the structural engineers were scratching their heads, thinking, how do we sort of limit that kind of torque? Um, and we did a lot of trial and error. We did. We, we tried welding. We tried different kinds of solutions. Um, at the end of the day, I think it is interesting to think about human behavior and how they know how to behave. Mm -hmm. You know, if you put a beer garden next to a bunch of swings and, you know, you can play a lot of rock music, people are just going <laughs> to go wild, you know. Um, how do you sort of, um, sort of man manage that? Um, we made the designs more robust. Mm -hmm. uh, we tried to put up signs. We put little stickers on it saying, please swing gently. You know, it, nothing worked. Um, <laughs> um, the, the, the signal spire in Roxbury, that's another example of like, it's an open source data set that's being broadcast. And most people walk by and they're like, oh, it's pretty lights, mm -hmm. fine. That's one level of understanding. Uh, if you read the sign that's there, it'll tell you more about what data sets there are. Um, and if you somehow know something about it, you know that if you tweet signal spire, hashtag signal spire, you can get a certain sort of behavior. Um, we talked a lot about that, and you know, thinking about Boston and the context of signalization, you know, one if by land, two if by sea, that's an encoded message, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I've been reading about encryption. Um, I just read Neil Stevenson's book, uh, Cryptonomicron, hmm. which is fantastic. It's about the birth of computation through the kind of uh, World War II kind of uh, ciphers and, right, and, right, and code right, practices. Right, right. Um, we also have the Hancock Building, which is like, you know, steady blue, you know, clear view, you know, flashing blue uh, th clouds do. This is not the, this is the older Hancock building, not the, not, not the, the new one. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, my daughter who's six knows that rhyme. She knows that she looks up and it's flashing blue. It means clouds are due, you know. So there, we actually tried to come up with a rhyme for the project in Roxbury, you know, what, how do we sort of encode a kind of, uh, a kind of uh, urban. Yeah. Um, civic memory. Idea. Civic memory. And I love that idea that we can sort of, in a way, broadcast something, but also that sort of uh, circulate a kind of uh, decoding uh, nursery rhyme. Mm -hmm. that w so I think that is a kind of interesting area of urban design. Right, right, right. Other questions? Question, yeah. Um, so the first sketches were circular, um, <laughs> I, you know, and I don't even remember who produced them. You know, it was a, you know, when you get a bunch of people together and you're like, what can we do? You know, and we had a bunch of circles packed together, and then they sort of absorbed into one big circle. Um, we liked the idea of this kind of walk. You know, you walk into the river and then walk out of the river. You know, so this kind of loop sort of became a kind of circuit. Um, you know, we're not um, we're not formalists. Mm -hmm. I think in any in any sense, we, there are certain things that reemerge. The circle was particularly um, useful. Well, and it, uh, it sir, I'll, I'll, I would just toss in that a, a circle has does have some real formal um, advantages in the sense that it's it's never out of alignment. It's never it's never awkwardly 
in relationship to its environment. It's always, there's no front or side or rear to the circle. It's always uh, just fine. That's why they yeah. make, you know, it's, it's good, uh, good form to resolve complicated urban patterns, for example. Yeah, it's so. a manhole cover. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, it's, also, it's also meant to be a classroom, you know, so the idea is that institutions would come and have these outdoor sort of learnings on the platform. Right on, right on the lawn. Yeah, yeah. so, um, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's useful, it's practical, um, it's experiential. It's, it, it's be the water, right? I mean, I, like, if I were, if I were gonna uh, uh, give it a headline, it is, instead of looking at the water, it's be, it, you, you, you are the water, you're right, like right down, yeah. Yeah, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, well, please join me uh, in, in thanking Eric. Thanks, George. That was fun.